On January 21st, 2010, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down what's been called a landmark decision in the case of Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission, in which the court held that no limits can be placed upon the amount of money a corporation can pour into an election to promote or smear candidates so as to influence the election's outcome. This decision will make certain that corporations can be assured to get the sort of politicians elected that will promote their interests above all others, because who has the money to purchase the candidate's favor back to the side of the public. Whatever sparse limitations corporations had on how much they could spend to influence the outcome of elections are now gone. Adios. Ciao. Auf Wiedersehen. Now, if a corporation doesn't like somebody, maybe because they won't play ball by towing the corporate line, the corporation or corporations that want to keep that person out of office can spend however many millions they want to completely trash that person's reputation with non-stop smear advertisements. So now a corporate lobbyist can approach any member of Congress and say, We have millions we can spend for or against you. Which one do you want it to be? Corporations spending money to affect the outcomes of elections isn't new by any means. But this decision has removed any and all constraints to the foregoing. Think that voters could potentially reverse this somehow? Not if corporations can help it. They'll use any and all powers at their disposal to demolish any and all meaningful attempts within the electoral system to roll back their power. January 21st, 2010 is when this country really, unquestioningly, definitively became the corporate states of America if it wasn't already. As many of us already know or suspect, particularly those of us in the more enlightened strata of the working majority, the government of the United States favors the wealthy. The richest 1% of U.S. society, who owns more wealth than the bottom 80% of the nation's populace, seems to have much more access to the apparatuses and levers of power of the state than does the average person. I would prefer to think that a lot, if not most of us, are already aware of this to some degree, even if it's only a vague impression Certainly, the super-rich are already quite conscientious of this. This goes back, of course, to the American Revolutionary Period, in the very first years of the Republic, when founder John Jay declared that, quote, the people who own the country ought to govern it, end quote, and only white males of property could vote. Then and since, the U.S. government has been on the side of the owning class. James Madison remarked that the role of the state was to, quote, protect the minority of the opulent against the majority, End quote. Though the shape and policies this took have varied at times, it has invariably defended an affluent minority class of property owners and its luxuries from what the framers of the Constitution called the leveling principle, which they defined as any form of redistribution or public expropriation of privately held property. Moreover, the framers were not just supporters of the affluent minority, they themselves were the affluent minority, or rather, all those occupying the commanding heights of U.S. government, as well as the authors of its legal documents, were men of property and leisure, many owning property in the form of human beings or slaves. Philosopher, economist, and overall radical thinker Karl Marx tells us that all governments are enforcement apparatuses of the dominant social class because the real basis or base of all societies are their economic systems, or the means by which they produce the necessities and amenities of life. All other components of society are built upon this base or economic foundation. Supposedly core social elements such as politics, culture, media, and religion exist to create a framework to uphold hold and maintain economic relations. Since the current dominant class in the United States is the bourgeoisie, the class that owns the means of production, the U.S. government functions as a security and enforcement mechanism for that class. Historically, ruling classes have always relied upon coercion to defend their dominance. The modern bourgeoisie, or capitalist class, is no different and has vast military forces, police, and courts to defend its rule from the people it exploits. In the domestic sphere, the the U.S. government previously used to be more inclined to shore up the capitalist system from destroying itself, as the capitalist system by its very nature is prone to excess. Unfettered, capitalism will lead to monopolies in which whole industries are dominated by single institutions unaccountable to no one but themselves and charging whatever outrageous prices they feel like. 
The U.S. government did this by instituting some regulations and creating some social programs to protect capitalism from itself, as well as to mollify the masses by mitigating some of the problems capitalism causes. But these regulations and social programs are being steadily eviscerated and done away with. Some authors have referred to this as the third worldization of the United States. Unemployment, home foreclosures, child malnutrition, elevated rates of crime and incarceration, more homelessness and destitution are are certain to escalate should this trend continue, and it likely will, and as it does, so will the people's desperation, indignation, and hunger for something different escalate proportionally. The capitalist system may be grudgingly tolerated for the moment, but as its excesses and outrages become more frequent and severe, the working majority's tolerance will wear thin to the point that they won't tolerate it anymore. Thank you for your attention. This has been a Comrade Banana Head production.